Hi everyone, my name is Ryan Fisher from Charles Darwin University, the Darwin Centre for Bushfires Research within the Research Institute for Environment and Livelihoods. Thank you very much for the opportunity to present to you today. I'm sorry, my Spanish is not very good, so I'll have to deliver this presentation in English and get my colleagues to help with some translation. Today I'm going to be talking to you about uh, 3D augmented landscapes and their use for supporting participatory mapping applications and for cross-cultural and intergenerational knowledge sharing. First I want to give you a bit of a background about myself, where I'm from and the sort of work that I've done that uh, has led me to develop this sort of technique that we're, we're sharing with you today. So I'm talking to you today from Darwin in Northern Australia and it's a long way from uh, any other major centre in Australia, so about three and a half thousand kilometres from Sydney. Uh, three... A long way from Southern Australia, about three and a half thousand kilometres from Sydney and Melbourne uh, to drive to their large cities down south takes uh, a week to 10 days, so people usually only fly. But we are very close and very closely connected with Indonesia, which is a, a very short distance away and where I've spent much of the last 15 years working. So across Eastern Indonesia and Northern Australia, focusing on capacity building, um, both for natural resource management projects, but for health information and service access applications but working with local governments primarily and trying to decentralise um, spatial ma mapping capability. But I find myself really working in these remote and regional contexts, working at what I would call the blunt edge of technology. So trying to find a technology which uh, is appropriate for um, regions which have uh, minimal resources but supports local knowledge in a way that can make a real impact on uh, decision making and uh, governance um, planning. I also work, work extensively across northern Australia and a lot of that work is related to supporting a large and growing fire management industry um, with significant, um, uh, significant uh, capacity building needs. So about five or six years ago I came across a group called SimTable, who were using sand as a basis to create 3D landscapes and then projecting over the top of them fire simulations. The purpose of their work was to support emergency management applications. Within emergency management there's traditionally been um, a form of role playing of emergency situations and sand tables have been a common method where people would use toy cars and toy houses and toy trees and emergency responders would get together and to discuss an emergency response plan or role play that plan. What SimTable did was to take that to the next level through their projection augmentation and their real time, their dynamic fire simulations and animations which allowed people to use uh, some really good underlying science around fire spread and incorporate that with uh, their planning and response. I was really impressed by the application and it was clear to me that there were opportunities to take this out of the emergency response realm and use it in other contexts, particularly the fire management context in Northern Australia. Around the same time I met a researcher called Dr. Scott Heckbert from Canada and he was working with a simulation software called NetLogo. He introduced me to the simulation software, NetLogo, which allowed me to explore developing my own fire simulations. I started pl then playing with developing some la uh, large landscape level fire simulations, incorporating them with uh, sand projection, similar to the SimTable group. Scott was intrigued by this work and uh, being in North America um, when 3D printing was uh, really getting going, um, he bought himself a 3D printer and started 3D printing landscapes and projecting a range of uh, 
uh, spatial data simulations. He was initially focusing on um, uh, hydro hydrology simulations. So through um, a very productive collaboration with uh, Scott, um, I started uh, developing the simulation skills, the 3D printing skills, and working together developing these uh, projection augmented uh, geo simulations. So there's a bit of background of the history of how I came to be doing this sort of work. I want to now go through a bit more of an outline of what I think are the key attributes of projection augmented landscapes and why they're really effective in engaging with communities and people and talking about spatial information, mapping information and planning. There are three key factors that I'd like to highlight. One is that the 3D landscapes are multi-sensory, they're multi-dimensional and through geosimulation they encourage play. So I call it making the digital physical through being able to project over the physical landscapes. We're able to actually physically engage with the projected information. The tactility of the projected landscapes I think is important and they support multi-sensory engagement. Decades of research has shown that we learn through multiple pathways of interaction. This multi-sensory multimodal learning process is really key to best learning and um, planning outcomes and this sort of physical or embodied learning works for everybody it's not just for indigenous people or local people everybody benefits from uh, physical embodied engagement through learning so that's the first and I think really important aspect of this sort of approach Secondly, what we're doing is creating a multi-dimensional world. So our mental maps of uh, the landscapes we live in and move through are three-dimensional. And we create our sense of place in relation to uh, mountains, hills or buildings. We live in a three-dimensional world and we place ourselves in the world in three dimensions. Being able to identify our location in the landscape is assisted through making that third dimension really explicit. It also assists people who don't have traditional two-dimensional map reading skills. I mean this map reading literacy isn't isn't a common skill for everybody. Um, so it helps people place themselves in the landscape. Also importantly all landscape processes happen in the third dimension. So where water flows, what plants and animals grow in different locations, um, where you can move through the landscape, the sort of agricultural practices you can do on the landscape, they're all dictated by the topography. So having that spatially explicit makes it much easier for us to understand um, the landscape processes and ecological processes and our engagement with the landscape. Also, as soon as we project dynamic simulations over the landscape, we're adding the dimension of time. So we essentially have a four-dimensional landscape. As we live in a three-dimensional world, in terms of placing ourselves in the third dimension, our world is also four-dimensional. Four we're always moving through the world and experiencing the world through time. So having a four-dimensional landscape mimics a more of a real-world association with the landscapes you're, you're engaged with. The third element that I'd like to emphasise is the way that the projection augmented landscapes help us to think through play and to discuss human ecological systems. They're complex with multiple interacting and biophysical and so social variables. Playing with these sort of complex systems can help us uh, explore alternative scenarios, emerging properties and unexpected outcomes. Building an understanding of complex systems help us also experiment with uh, ideas and share our own ideas and lived experience of the landscape. This connects with the final point which I think is really important. That is how we support local knowledge through these landscapes. The projection augmented landscapes, and it enables us to project a range of scientific data sets but also social cultural data sets, 
and also through open communication allows people to sort of share local knowledge and lived experience and cultural stories. The projection augmented landscapes also look spectacular. They bring people in and they create a stage to share and think and discuss ideas. So I just want to reiterate these three key concepts, the multi-sensory, multi-dimensional and the ability to play with landscapes really reconfigure the way we think, interact and learn with geospatial data. This Venn diagram tries to conceptualise some traditional fields of practice and how they are combined to support what I call participatory 3D geosimulation. The bottom left, left we've got uh, traditional participatory GIS practice. On the right I've got uh, 3D GIS. These have been combined to form a practice of 3D participatory GIS traditionally developed using paper and cardboard that engages communities to create 3D landscapes and through that process discussing traditional knowledge and capturing traditional spatial knowledge. At the top of the diagram I've got geosimulation which is a form of geospatially explicit agent-based modelling or simulation modelling. So combining geosim geosimulation and participatory GIS, you can create a form of participatory geospatial agent-based modelling. Combining geosimulation and 3D GIS, you've got 3D geospatial agent-based modelling. And combining all of these together is the core of what I've been doing, which is the participatory 3D geosimulation. I want to move on now to talk about a range of uh, applications for this sort of work. So I'll be talking to my work in fire management, applications for understanding hydrology and water management, and also applications for traditional livelihoods. So first with regard to fire management in Northern Australia, Northern Australia is one of the most fire prone landscapes on earth. You can see in this figure here the north is where the majority of fires occur in Australia and most of northern Australia is burnt every year or at least every two to three years. The management of these fires has significant biodiversity, greenhouse gas and regional economy and employment outcomes. Traditional land management practice by Indigenous Australians carried out for 60,000 years involved burning throughout the landscape early in the year, not long after our monsoonal wet season where everything was green and you would get quite cool fires. A cool fire looks like this. It just burns the grass layer and not the canopy of the tree. So ecologically they're quite mild, not very destructive. Animals can escape these fires easily and other than reducing the grass fuel load, they do very little other damage to the, the ecology. In contrast, a hot fire has quite significant effects on uh, the forest cover and local plants and animals. These fires are usually occur very late in the year, late in the dry season, long after the monsoon ends and the grass is very dry, the weather is very hot, so you get these very large and destructive fires. To reduce the occurrence of late, hot, dry season fires, strategic early dry season mitigation burns are used to create a patch mosaic of fire ages. In this context, I have used the 3D projection augmented landscapes with fire simulations to support best practice fire management working with Indigenous Australians across Northern Australia. So most of this work has been supporting Indigenous land management workshops, which facilitate intergenerational knowledge exchange and the two-way learning, the learning between the local knowledge, traditional knowledge and science knowledge. So the empowerment of Indigenous knowledge in a field of fire management, which is dominated by hard scientific data, I think is key to getting good outcomes. Many of the applications with uh, local indigenous groups have been conducted uh, out bush, whilst camping, under the stars at night, 
using a generator and the projector pointing down and using sand as the 3D landscape. This sort of uh, format creates like creates what I call a digital campfire, bringing people to, to, together to discuss fire management. The first application I'm going to talk about occurred in a place called Dimaru, a fairly remote part of a region called Arnhem Land, indigenous owned land in northern Australia. Dimaru land has mining interests as well as indigenous land interests as well as tourists who come to visit it. So in trying to improve their fire management activity they had to incorporate and balance all of those different uh, stakeholder groups. The workshop I conducted um, was to support this fire management planning and uh, I used sand as the basis and I've got all the different stakeholder groups. So you can see in this photo I've got a mine worker a non-indigenous uh, land manager, an indigenous land manager, all on their hands and knees, moulding the sand to the shape of the uh, moulding the sand to the shape of the projected elevation data. This immediately changed the dynamic and the way these different people um, communicated with each other, playing with the sand like they were children before the serious discussion around land management, fire management, really changed the way people engaged. As one of the local indigenous people said, everyone shared knowledge, both Yolnu, indigenous people, and Malanda, the white people. Everyone felt comfortable, not shy, and they're willing to talk each to each other about fire in our area. And the second example was an area called Arafura in uh, central Arnhem Land. In this example, we set up the sand landscape, got the local community to build the landscape, and then projected the fire simulation over the top at night. It looked spectacular, and a lot of the kids came in. I also set up the projector using a infrared detector, so we could make the projected surface into an interactive surface using the infrared light calibration tool. This enabled the children to initiate the model using a cigarette lighter, which sort of added a certain degree of uh, theatre and fun to the whole enterprise. You can see in this picture the uh, sand projection actually looks really quite detailed. It's amazing how using sand as your um, landscape base, when you project over the top the hill shaded relief image, your eye plays a trick. It's like an optical illusion where it fills in all the detail and it looks like you've got a highly complex landscape, a really effective sort of tool. So we're running these 3D simulations at night, the children were playing and the older people in the community were providing a narrative, a story that they wanted the children to be thinking about in relation to fire management in this landscape. During the day we'd go out and do some traditional burning with local people and then at night come back to look at the fire simulation model and to extend that discussion. It was really very effective. Oh, this is just another picture of using the cigarette lighter to uh, initiate the, uh, the fire simulation model. The third area I wanted to mention was a group called Mima, also in Arnhem Land, a group of indigenous rangers. For them I created a 3D printed landscape um, and they used it extensively to support engagement with uh, their local community, taking the 3D printed landscape to the local school to talk about their fire management activities, but also taking it out to other cultural events. This particular landscape um, is used primarily by the women rangers in this group, and they were very proud to have uh, mastered this technology. And for me, this was a great outcome because it wasn't me who was in control of it. I'd handed over the whole projection augmented 3D landscape simulation to a group of local people to use and to use to support education around what they do with their local knowledge. The final fire management example I wanted to mention was to support the joint management of a national park called Jutbara. This park is under joint management with local indigenous people and government. The park was in a process of transitioning to a joint fire management project they had external funding to try and improve the fire regimes in the park, but they need to get uh, consent and support and engagement from local indigenous landholders. 
So we conducted a series of workshops through different parts of the park with different uh, traditional owner groups. Many of the camps that we had were extremely remote, requiring hours of four-wheel driving to get there. But at each place, national parks had arrived before and they built a projection pavilion out of tarpaulins and metal frames that you can see at the bottom of this tree here, which then allowed me to conduct the landscape fire projection augmentation simulations each evening. In this example you can see inside the tent one of the uh, elders, an old woman, had taken control of uh, providing the narrative around the simulation and all the young people were listening intently whilst playing with the technology but hearing the stories about traditional fire management. So this was using a 3D printed landscape but I also conducted a version of the simulation using um, the sand as a basis. One night we were doing this and a, a large python was uh, slithering past and one, and one of the rangers grabbed the python and placed it on the landscape. So we had like this huge landscape rainbow serpent moving over the projection. It was really quite a spectacular moment. So I now want to talk very briefly about uh, using 3D projection augmented surfaces to support catchment modelling and understanding hydrological processes. So as I mentioned earlier, I've been working extensively with Dr. Scott Heckbert based in uh, Edmonton in Canada. And he's been working with the 3D projection augmented landscapes to visualise model runs of uh, flooding impacts for uh, Calgary. So he found the 3D visualization, particularly in a large workshop format, using the projection augmentation really helped people uh, understand how water was moving over the landscape and what were the threats and pressures around flood mitigation activities. I've also used the projection simulation approach to explore the impacts of small scale mining. So we had a project in eastern Indonesia where there were significant impacts from gold mining and the flow of mercury over the landscape. So I was using a projection augmented model with a simple flow simulation to allow people to visualize in 3D where you might get deleterious sediment flows from a mine site. I now want to talk briefly about using projection augmented landscapes to support livelihood applications. So there's work that uh, Jose and his team at Centro Geo have conducted in Mexico, which I think he'll talk to you about directly. I'll just mention now some work that I have done in Cameroon, um, supporting participatory GIS and mapping applications. So really, so that project was working with uh, indigenous forest people and I was supporting a larger project um, working with the working with the forest people to support their indigenous rights, support their livelihoods, health and well-being whilst also trying to support good conservation and biodiversity outcomes. This first picture shows the presentation of the landscape model um, in the capital city Yonde to uh, NGOs and uh, other government staff who are working in the Congo Basin and trying to explain the particular land management and indigenous land use issues uh, to get a common understanding of that landscape. This picture shows the presentation of the landscape model um, to the local community, the Baka Pygmy people. Um, and we were showing a whole range of landscape information, um, which uh, they found of interest. But as you can see the, in this photo, the, the real engagement came when I projected over the top of that an animated track of people moving over the landscape using the GPS information they'd collected. So when I animated data that they had collected themselves, of their traditional hunt, they're moving through their traditional hunting areas. It really got people excited and engaged. So it became an effective tool to talk about the management of that landscape. This is the model that uh, I projected over the top 
you can see on the left there are a range of uh, landscape overlays and on the right we can select a range of animations um, or simulations of people using the landscape and landscape processes. I just want to mention briefly another application that uh, I've trialled using um, the projection augmented approach um, and this was looking at uh, modelling of access to services. So I've done a lot of work in Eastern Indonesia where I was looking at uh, access to emergency obstetric care and how, how people were able to travel to access that care and distance for travel. Um, and we were creating a range of uh, automated processes to allow people to interactively explore travel time analysis. So travel is often complex and multimodal and to improve the accuracy, you need to incorporate, once again, that local knowledge. So I created a travel time access tool um, using NetLogo Net simulation software to enable dynamic travel time modelling. And this, once again, projected over the top of um, the 3D modelling proved really very effective. The three pictures here, the one on the right, shows a landscape with a land cover projected over the top and roads and where hospitals are. The one in the middle shows the model after a travel time analysis has been run. And the blue areas are closer to points where there are hospitals or points of care. The final model is divided up into access zones where areas which are red are more than two hours from emergency care. So this sort of service access modeling where you're developing infrastructure, whether you're building roads or um, placing a new point of access, whether it be a hospital or a police station or a school or a market. The way you move through country is really very tied to the topography. So being able to view that in, a three, in 3D is very, very useful. So what I'm suggesting here the, is that the 3D projection process is not only useful for a natural resource or land management application, but can also be useful for thinking about uh, people accessing services and building infrastructure also could be used in an emergency response context. So how long does it take for a, an emergency responder after a flood or an earthquake to travel to points that have been damaged and to be able to view that in 3D, where roads are, where tracks are and where the points of access are, this can be really very useful. So I'll just talk quickly about uh, various methods for conducting uh, 3D projection augmented landscape applications. So this table quickly shows a, a range of different um, tools and approaches going from using a 3D printed surface or a clay or a, it's called magic sand, it's like a moldable sand or just easily um, accessed white sand that you can get from the beach. That's on the x-axis. On the y-axis I describe various forms of interactivity. So the easiest form is just using projection. If you add any sort of infrared activity or simulation, that adds the level of complexity. Um, there are some interactive tools that use uh, laser scanning and modelling to actually allow you to change the surface and then the model itself responds to the surface. But this adds, adds again another level of complexity. So what I'm trying to illustrate here is at the simplest level to use some of the impact of uh, 3D projection augmented landscapes is you can just use a bucket of sand and as long as you can direct a projector to project down onto the sand you can create an effective 3D landscape that incorporates all those key aspects of a tactile three-dimensional sort of space to, to facilitate discussion and play and thinking through uh, complex human ecological situations. As soon as you add 3D printing or degrees of simulation, then it becomes more complex. But the effects are... This is an example of some um, colleagues at APIC University in Southern Australia. I was demonstrating the sand approach. You can see once again we've got some people who are not used to being on their hands and knees playing in the sand, creating on these landscapes, and then producing once we project over the top in a really very effective uh, landscape for um, subsequent play and simulation. This is an example of uh, using the sand as a basis. Uh, in this case, we created a sim 
a simple simulation of a volcano, Popocatapetl, near uh, Mexico City exploding. So this was for a demonstration at UNAM in Mexico. The other thing I've started to experiment with more recently is creating uh, architectural 3D spaces. Um, so we need not be limited uh, to large 3D landscapes. Um, you could also potentially be printing sort of village landscapes and be projecting over the top of them uh, a range of village information and also potentially dynamic simulations of uh, people and vehicles moving through the village or um, different land use changes within the village. But once again, adding that tactile third dimension I think is quite important. Just mentioned some other work. Um, so this is a print of a 3D print of Nepal, so the Himalayas. And this was used by a PhD student at my university without projection, but to support community engagement in talking about their land use in relation to supporting conservation of a threatened species. Um, because the terrain um, in the Himalayas was uh, a really important part of the way people understood and moved through the landscape, um, it didn't really need a great deal, it didn't need projection over the top for people to be able to interact and engage with the 3D print and that to become a useful way of doing participatory mapping. Just some concluding concepts. I think the key thing to the 3D projection landscapes are they, they are dynamic, interactive, they support learning, teaching, sharing, and mutual discussion. You're able to explore complex systems through simulation. They support science communication and traditional ecological knowledge and support, importantly, that two-way learning. So we need to also learn from local knowledge and traditional knowledge and support the use of science and evidence-based planning. The tools that we are describing, they're easily portable, they're robust, very strong, they're pretty cheap, it's really the main cost is buying the projector, and if you're using a 3D printed landscape, of course the 3D printer. They're highly scalable, so depending on how you uh, mount the projector and the size of the sand or 3D printed scape that you're using, um, you can have a whole range of different uh, size projections. So if there's any further questions, um, that's my email address. Uh, I highly recommend you have a look at uh, the website that I've created which has a little bit more information about the 3D modeling um, process and applications, www.landscapemodels.net. I also have a YouTube channel with a lot of uh, training and support videos. If you just type my name into Google, you can access a lot of geospatial tutorial videos that uh, might be of help. Some of them are specifically related to 3D models, some of them are more related to geosimulation and the use of uh, raster-based uh, geoanalysis. And have a look at the uh, International Journal of Applied Geography paper that uh, we recently published. I think Jose will mention this paper to you. Thank you for the opportunity to present to you today and uh, have a great workshop.